भगवते वासुदेवाय Surrender unto me, I reward you. 
accordingly. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is within the heart of all of us. He also describes Sarvasya Chaham Hridishani Vishnu Matasmiti Rjana Bhakavanam Cha that as the Lord seated within the core of our heart, He is the source of our remembrance, our knowledge, and our forgetfulness. In fact, He reciprocates with us exactly according to our desire in life. <coughs> Therefore, in essence, the path of yoga or the path of religion is the process taught by the Lord and his great servitors by which we can learn how to properly approach God. How to approach him with the proper desire. You see, in this world, the tendency is to become very spiritually complacent. Especially when our material necessities are very nicely provided. Because factually, almost everyone is more or less completely materialistic. even though we may have some religion in our life, when it comes down to where our energy is directed, it's more or less with the motive of providing the necessities and the pleasures of our senses and the senses of those who are near and dear to us. And therefore, when the necessities of life, the pleasures of life, are being very nicely provided, then there really is not so much need to ask much of God. We will casually request Him to give us liberation at the time of death and to protect the situation that we have in this world. But there is not much intensity in our prayer to the Lord. Therefore, knowing this tendency to be so deeply rooted within our conditioned consciousness, the Lord creates oftentimes very, very difficult tests for the aspiring devotees. And the purpose of these tests is to give the devotee the chance to cry out in helpless dependence of God's mercy. Sometimes when a devotee is in a predicament, someone may ask, why is God allowing that to happen to his devotee? The answer is because he is very kind to his devotee. You see, the greatest obstacle in our spiritual life is false pride. And everyone is a victim of false pride. Everyone is thinking prakriti kriyamane ni gunai karamani sarabhasha ahankara vimudhatma kartaham iti manyate That I am the doer of my activity. Just see what I have done. Just see what I am doing. 
and wait and see what I will do. Literally everyone is a victim of this way of thinking. And when everything is going our way, we consider that we have everything very nicely under control. And therefore, what is the need of God? We may do our puja, we may chant our mantras, but for all practical purposes, what really is the need of God? By my good efforts, by my intelligence, everything is going on just according to plan. This consciousness is the worst enemy to one who wants to chant the name of God properly. When we chant the holy names of the Lord, we must understand that it is the quality in which we chant which will be the cause of the result of our chanting. Some people chant mantras so many times every day for so many years and they wonder why I am not feeling the Divine Presence of God. Because this process is not mechanical. In the process of bhakti, nothing is mechanical. <coughs> Recently, we approached one very great sadhu. And we were discussing formalities in the Vaishnava tradition. And he was explaining, in the Vaishnav tradition, there are no formalities. Every single relationship and every way we deal with every single person is not a formality. It is an expression of love. It is a means of purification. Someone asks, uh, is the relation of the Diksha Guru or the Sannyas Guru more important? Or is one just a formality? He said, what is this formality? There are no questions of formalities. Every relationship that we have and every way we deal with every individual is based on love and respect and service. You see, the path of bhakti casts out all empty formalities and all superficial mechanical processes. Everything we do, every dealing we have is meant to be done in an attitude of service, devotion and sacrifice. And of all of the principles in the process of bhakti, there is nothing more emphasized, nothing more essential for our spiritual purification than the chanting of the holy names of God. So how much we must guard against taking the chanting of the holy names as a formality or as a mechanical process. When we chant the name of God, we are petitioning the Lord who is non different than His name to reciprocate with us by showering us with His mercy. And he will reciprocate <coughs> exactly according to the feeling in which we are chanting, to the sincerity in which we call out his name. 
Therefore, the Lord describes to Maharaj Yudhisthira, Yasyaham anagrinami harishyeta dhanam shanai. Sometimes I purposely put my devotees in difficult situations so that my devotee has no one else and nothing else to turn to except me. And in such a state of consciousness, he cries out my holy name with very, very high quality of feeling. <coughs> Today, many of you perhaps have witnessed on the Mahabharat series the disrobing of Draupadi. And people with a philosophical mind often question why did Krishna allow this to happen to his devotees? First of all, why Maharaj Yudhisthira who is such a great, great king with such integrity as an honest man, why in the world would he take part in a gambling match? After all, there are four regulative principles. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating and no gambling. So why would he gamble? That is first question. Second is why would Krishna allow this evil-minded Sakuni and Duryodhana to win the gambling match and take everything away? And if why, if the Pandavas were such great heroes, such fearless devotees of the Lord, why did they sit there on the floor and say nothing and do nothing to protect their own wife who was being stripped naked by unscrupulous personalities. These questions, they have come to your mind? First of all, let us understand that whatever the Lord does through his devotees often has many, many, many purposes to fulfill. There are external and internal reasons for all the dealings of the, of the Lord with his devotees. First of all, Maharaj Yudhisthira was a Kshatriya. Now today, there are no Kshatriyas. There is practically no such thing as a Kshatriya on earth anymore who has the qualities of a real Kshatriya. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes what are the qualities of a real Kshatriya. He is completely fearless. He is heroic. He is expert in combat. He is the protector of the innocent. He is chivalrous. In the days of the Vedic age, the king, when he would declare war against another military force, he would be the first one on the battlefield with a sword in his hand to fight. So you see, the king would not declare war unless it was something very important, because his life was at stake. Therefore, he had to be very heroic and fearless. Today, what kings, what prime ministers, what presidents would even consider going anywhere near the battlefield? Huh? They usually remain thousands of miles away. What prime ministers, what presidents would even consider
consider going anywhere near the battlefield. Huh? They usually remain thousands of miles away in a nice presidential mansion with so many security guards and secret age, secret service men all around protecting them. And they are living in a plush room with soft furniture, drinking their liquor, watching their TV, and making all sorts of political decisions. And what are those political decisions? To send the innocent youth to the battlefield, where they're being slaughtered wholesalely by the enemy. And he just keeps recruiting more and more and more and more men to go to the battlefield and shed their blood. By the Vedic standard, that person is not a king. He is not a kshatriya. He is a coward. He is a low-class man who has taken the role that he does not deserve to have. But we find that the political leaders of every country in the world are like this. But in the Vedic times, when Kshatriyas were Kshatriyas, even the worst, most heinous demons, if they were king, they would be first in the battlefield. What to speak of the righteous? Because that was the code of a Kshatriya. The code of a Kshatriya was that he would never, ever, ever refuse any challenge, whatever it was. Therefore, when Maharaj Yudhisthira was challenged to a game of dice, as a Kshatriya, it was his duty, he was obliged that he could not refuse that challenge. Whether it was licit or illicit, it was a challenge that had to be accepted. So the question is, if somebody challenges us to gamble, does that mean we should gamble? Huh? Because sometimes people do like this. I bet you that this happens like this. So does that mean we should think, well, Maharaj Yudhisthira could not refuse a challenge, so neither can I. Huh? If you are a Brahman, a Vaishya, a Sudra, or anything else, you are not allowed to gamble ever. But if you are a qualified Kshatriya, then you have that right. Now, as I say, there are no Kshatriyas on earth anymore of that stature. So therefore, gambling is not justified for anyone today. It is simply illicit activity. If you are willing to give your life to protect any innocent creature on earth, then you have a right to gamble like Maharaj Yudhisthira. Because Maharaj Yudhisthira was willing to give his life, risk his life, to protect any innocent creature in the kingdom. Even if it be an insignificant dog, or a cow, or a low-class person. <coughs> Maharaj Yudhisthira was the protector of all praja, all the uh, citizens of his kingdom. And if even the most insignificant personality came to him with a problem, he took it as his life and soul to solve the problem of that person. Even if it meant risking his life. If we have that quality, then we can know that we are a Kshatriya who must accept all challenge. So therefore, for Maharaj Yudhisthira, there was absolutely nothing illicit about accepting gambling. It would have been illicit for him to refuse. 
because it would have been below his integrity as a Chachya to refuse any challenge. <coughs> Second of all, Krishna wanted to show how horribly dangerous gambling really is. He wanted to warn us, warn us through this episode that nobody should ever go near this process of gambling. Whoever you are, however great you are, when you come in the process of this activity, you become intoxicated and you lose your intelligence. And it is a fact. Just like in America there is, or in India too, all over the world there is Alcoholics Anonymous. <coughs> there is Drug Users Anonymous. Now, the biggest growing organization of this type in the Western world is Gamblers Anonymous. Because once you get gambling in your system, it's an addiction that impels you to gamble again and again and again. You cannot stop. It goes beyond your control. All of your rational thinking and intelligence is stolen away by this vice. And it is a fact. It is habit forming. Therefore, even such a great soul as Maharaj Yudhisthira, if he lost his intelligence due to the infatuation of gambling, what is our position? How much we must be very careful to ever, never, ever, ever even consider. It is one of the four pillars of sinful life. Krishna also wanted to show the nobility of Maharaj Yudhisthira. How he was such a man of high honor that when he would give his word there would be no condition possible that would divert his attention from fulfilling his promise. Today, words are so cheap. People just, their tongues are so uncontrolled. Their minds are so uncontrolled. They will just say anything. Not considering the consequence or the responsibility they have for each word they speak. People are very fond of gossiping, criticizing others not knowing what a responsibility they have and what the consequences that will come upon them for doing this. Not even knowing whether what they're saying is actually true or untrue. They speak. This is the sign of a very low-class mentality. Maharaj Yudhisthira he would not speak anything that was not truth. He would not speak anything that was not beneficial for all persons involved. And whatever he would say, he would back up with his life. Huh? Now we say something, and if we're challenged, you say like this, then we, oh, I didn't mean it like that, or I didn't actually say that. Huh? So easy. When Maharaj Yudhisthira would say something, he would back that word up with everything he had. This is called honor. Krishna describes that Rakchatriya to be dishonored is worse than death. Now is this a bodily conception of life? Why are we so attached to honor? 
it is not simply an idea of false prestige that to be dishonored is worse than death. But for Akchachya, because they had such high integrity that whatever they would say, whatever they would do in the service of God, if they were to back down or be dishonest in any way, shape, or form, that would be worse than death. You see, in this age of Kali Yuga, people are not very concerned with honor or truth or honesty. But Maharaj Yudhisthira, <coughs> when he vowed to gamble his own life, his brother's life, his kingdom, all his possessions, all of his wealth, and even his wife. Although he did it in the intoxication of gambling, still he was a man of such honor that he would not back down for anything. He understood how responsible he was for everything he said. That is the conduct of a civilized man or a civilized woman. Some people may say, well, this is not a very spiritual thing. This is simply mundane morality. But this is a spiritual thing. Because unless Krishna specifically and directly tells you to say something against the codes of honesty, you have absolutely no right to tell a lie or to be dishonest in any circumstance of life without the blessings of the great souls. So Maharaj Yudhisthira taught the people of the world how to be a man of your word even under the most difficult conditions of life. You see, it's easy to become a man of your word when everything is just the way you like it. But when it takes great sacrifice and pain to stand behind your word, it takes a man of very deep sincerity. Maharaj Yudhisthira was such a man. Krishna also wanted to show the flickering nature of everything of this world. How you could be the king of earth in one second, 